Good morning, everybody. This is Dr. Winkler again. This should be our fourth lecture dealing with the World War I class. I hope you're excited because I am. I love talking about history. Unfortunately, there are some very negative aspects of World War I which we have to discuss because the entire experience, shall we say, is negative, very much so. The last time we were discussing the arms races, excuse me, we were the arms races in the, in the sense of talking about the, the amount of money or percentage of the national budget that goes into the military of various countries and the number of men that are also in the standing army. One of the things that I have not really said much of anything about is the reserve system. If you go in and look at these people, you say, all right, uh, the Germans have men that serve for two years. The, the uh, French have men that serve for two years. Uh, this is, in case of France, virtually everybody can get, in, get into a uniform. In Germany, it's, it's, it's a large percentage, it's about half. Well, what happens to you after you leave your full-time military service? Of course, you've been there for a long time. You've had a lot of training. Well, then you go into reserve system. Depending on how old you are, you will be, shall we say, more active reserves. The older you get, the less times you meet, the less times you drill. You know, sometimes these units don't come together for like every three years. You get together and you drill. If you put all that into the matrix, then these numbers are misleading. When the war breaks out, August 1914, many of these powers involved, if you include the German reserve system, you add have a total of four and a half million men. The case of France is close to four million men. The case of Russia, it's six million men. We'll talk about how there are, shall we say, there are misapprehensions, particularly on the case of French, as to the use or initial use of reserves. They're going to believe that the German army will not use their reserves Im immediately. They need to be kind of refreshed and retrained. Well, the Germans do use them immediately. Can we say, therefore, looking at the numbers, uh, go back up to France, if I can get up there easily, get back to France, the large number of men they have in uniform, and you compare that with the Germans, it seems to be somewhat less. Yes, it does. But when you throw the reserves in, can we say the numerical superiority that the French had in having their standing army literally disappears? Well, one thing that even though in some cases on this amount of material I've given you, we actually take a look and see that, okay, we're looking at numbers to the shy of 1914. What is not adequately represented here is that there is actually a rush to build up the military from 1910, 1910, 1912, 1913, going to 1914. So we're talking about building up forces. And let's look at the another very spectacular and very expensive thing that Great Britain and Germany gets involved in. And this is the Britain and the German naval race. The British have had the world's best Navy for a very lengthy period of time. Well, why do not other people have a tendency to compete with them? Well, one of the issues, of course, is very expensive. Another issue is Britain believes in free trade. Many countries look upon the British as somebody who will help promote free trade and also police the sea lanes. So when the British are there, you're going to have a lot less problems with pirates. You know, people grabbing vessels and plundering them or holding people for hostage. A lot of people say, it's a good thing the British are doing this because everybody can't afford to. On the other hand, 
does Germany have the right to build a very large navy? Go over here and get all the way over here. Uh, to protect their commerce. Well, Germany doesn't have nearly the colonial empire the British do. The British have been so effective, they've grabbed almost every choke point in the world. Even going to the Mediterranean, they've got Gibraltar. In the central Mediterranean itself, they've got Malta. They've got Safe Cape Town, South Africa. They've got Singapore in the Straits over by Malaysia. I mean, they're watching everything. And as long as they don't bother anybody else's trade, most people are happy with this. But then there's the Kaiser. There's William II. And he, can he really take pride in the magnificent German army? Well, probably not. It was really developed before him. So how are you going to feed your pride? Yes, he's read, Alf, he's read Alfred Thayer Mahans, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. Yes, he says, to make Germany a great nation, we've got to have overseas colonies. Remember, Germany runs around grabbing every piece of ground and sometimes islands as well that nobody else has so far, just so they'll have something. A lot of this is not very valuable at all. And then you have to have this Navy. Well, could this be viewed as stupid? Yes, I think it was stupid. Yeah, you can say Germany has the right to protect its commerce. Yes, it has the right to build a Navy if it wants to. But the stupidity of this is, it's very expensive. And, and, and you're really, do you really think that you're going to have, have enough power that you can actually threaten the power of Britain? You see, when Germany starts building its Navy, your bigger Navy, Britain, of course, has a much bigger Navy to start with. And you simply start pushing this up. So when the Germans go up, the British say, no, we have to have superiority. Initially, the British say, we have to have a two to one superiority. We have to have twice as many combat vessels, in other words, battleships, as the Germany have. Well, Germany, with a bigger iron and coal productivity, bigger industrial base, can actually build these faster. So the British, rather than having stay, they have the two to one advantage. Uh, then, then they're going to allow there to be a two thirds, as long as Germany's surface ships do not exceed two thirds of the British. That's acceptable. But you see. Now we got to start taxing the British more heavily. While Germany and, and Britain have got along for a, got, got, got along well for a lengthy period of time, they're old friends actually. In reality, now you start getting the British nervous and afraid. When we talk about Zeppelinitis, which I talked about earlier, it's easy for the British to start to fear the Germans. This is enormously expensive. As I mentioned earlier, the most expensive of your military branches is, in fact, the Navy. Ships are terribly expensive. Once again, social problems in Germany and also in Britain, where one third of the people in London are living in poverty. And now you're pumping all this money into the Navy. They believe it's for defense, obviously. Now, let's just be hypothetical. Let's say that, that, that the Germans, under Kaiser William, decided that they were going to take all that money that he put in the Navy and put it into the Army. The Army is very well funded anyway, very, very large. You had to put all that money into the Army. You can imagine the huge Army and the huge amount of munitions and weapons that the Germans would have had. Had that money gone into there, the German army probably would have been unstoppable in 1914. But that did not happen. So I'm going to say this is foolish. It's foolish for the Germans. A lot of ill will and a lot of wasted, wasted money. And they never do get superiority over the British. Something else is happening in this naval arms race. And that is also an improvement on ship designs. Let's take a look at ships before the naval arms race, which includes an increase in quality of ships. So the USS Olympia, I'm trying to remember. I think it's USS Olympia. Let's look and see if I'm right. The Olympia was the flagship of was it Admiral Dewey's 
May 1st attack on the Spanish fleet at Manila Bay. The ship is a museum piece now. It's in Philadelphia. I've been there. I visited it. It's really quite fun. <clears throat> it's much smaller than the kinds of things you would normally expect to see in a battleship. But this is state of the art in 1898. There is a plaque on the floor where Admiral Dewey stood, which is where his feet were at, when he said the infamous words, you may fire when ready, Gridley. Is there a lot of throw weight here? Can you see the, the guns are kind of sticking out the side? Uh, this is this is enough to blow the Spanish right out of the water, and they do. But this is state of the art in 1898. However, you come up with something different called the dreadnought. And uh, so now let's take a look at advanced ship design. The dreadnought battleship. The first of these was the HMS dreadnought. Dreadnought is from a biblical quote, which means fear nothing. Obviously, if you got this kind of throw weight against the Olympia, for example, yeah, you're not going to be afraid of them at all. Let's see. You get a dreadnought here. This is a pretty good angle. Let's see if I can get this one up. Come on, puppy. And you can see that you have a turrets. These are large turrets. This is an earlier version of the dreadnought. You do have turrets rather than having guns poking out the side. You have a turret on the main deck so you can fire in, in either direction. As you can see, if I get that any bigger, probably not. If, uh, no, that's not too bad. You can see that we have turrets. And you can see that you can turn and fire them in either direction. These are larger guns. Usually when we're talking about the shell size of a battleship, you're talking about the width of the bore. In this case, you have earlier dreadnoughts about 12 inch. But as you go up, you get larger, larger guns. In other versions, you get 14 inch, you get 15 inch. You can imagine the size, the huge, the huge difference in shells than the, the, the Olympia had like five inch guns. So bigger, faster, turrets. Let's give you a super dreadnought here. What was it? The, uh, now remember, I've seen the Ben to Philadelphia, and I've seen the Olympia. However, on the New Jersey side of the river, across the Delaware River, there's the New Jersey. She's also a vessel that you're using as a museum. So you pay a few bucks and you go inside go inside and you walk all over. Holy cow. Let's see if I can give you a bigger version of this. This is before they took her out of commission. Notice she has turrets with three big big cannon. I believe these are 15 inch. And this makes the Olympia look like a cracker box. It also makes the, the, the dreadnought herself look somewhat tiny. The largest battleship, the Super Dreadnought, was the Yamato. Yamato is outside the scope of this course because she was built for the Japanese and she saw, well, she saw very little action in the Second World War. Very big, very big, the largest battleship and literally that's ever been devised. And I believe her guns are like 18 inch guns reason why she saw relatively little action during the Second World War is that uh, she's well known, big pride, and if she got sunk well, we would lose all this prestige. So actually you've created an enormous, enormous vessel, 18 inch guns, and they really don't use her. And of course the Americans get her and sink her. So we have the Dreadnought class. Bigger ships, faster ships, bigger throw weight. I've already mentioned this. Let's go back. At one point, the German Navy, we're talking the heavy battle cruisers, the battleships. The British finally say, we can't keep a two to one advantage. It is simply too costly. We will have to go with two to three. Now, let's mention the Kaiser a little in this 
matrix. Kaiser William II happens to be the Kaiser that is leading Germany before and during the, Second, the First World War. He's a very odd man in many respects. His, when his grandfather died, of course his father should live and rule. His father had something on his throat, inside of his throat. The doctor went in and rather than removing all of it, it was probably cancerous, rather than removing all of it, he made a mistake and left a little bit of material there. In doing so, the cancer came back and it killed him. Now, had this man lived for a few more years, few more decades, the, shall we say, dangerous and somewhat neurotic man, Kaiser William II, would not have ruled at least for a while. Can we say, by virtually a, a physician's accident, the history of Germany and perhaps a lot of Europe is sent into a much more brutal phase. Well, let's take a look at him, Kaiser William II. Sometimes I like to tell my students that there are arguments about should we uh, do, do history, excuse me, does history teach lessons and some historians say it does not. Well, I tend to make an argument like, well, I think history does teach lessons, at least in a broad sense, such as democracy is better than dictatorship. Let me expand that a little bit. Democracy or representative governments are better than monarchies as well. Because we have a man who comes in to the leader, leadership of the most powerful nation in Europe, and this man should not have been there. He's the wrong man. When he was born, there was kind of a difficult delivery. And uh, once again, the physicians that were helping with the birth made a big mistake. In trying to bring the baby out, apparently they wrenched an arm. Notice him as an adult here. Notice his left arm. His left arm, as you can see, is shorter than his right arm. His right arm was a powerful arm. Because he could not build up his left arm. He, he could move it. But it's lacking muscular structure. And of course, he's going to be paranoid. Because he thinks he's misshapen. Well, he doesn't look exactly right. Of course, you have the best tailors in Germany making his uniforms, and he loves uniforms, loves to show off, loves to be walking around looking cool. And you can make these uniforms to a point where you don't notice this as much, but it's still there. I'm not sure the best way to raise kids. If you want to get an idea how I raise my kids, ask them. They might have a much better insight in how well I did. However, I'm going to say that well, however they handled this, this boy growing up was wrong. <clears throat> they refused to allow him to take any back off from anything because of his arm. When he was a young boy, the, you know, you've got to be a man. You've got to learn how to ride a horse. And he would get on. He can't hold on properly. And he would cry and say, yeah, get, you know, you're a Kaiser. You're going to get on and ride a horse again. You're kind of mean to him. However they did it, rather than raising a man with, with good self-esteem, he was raised with weak self-esteem. He's always got to be proving himself. He was so strong, he got so strong with that good arm which he could use, that he'd actually chop wood with it. Now, if you've ever chopped wood, and this is a good way to get in shape, guys. If you ever want to get really, really good shape, chop wood, because that is hard work. That's hard work with two hands. And obviously, the axes tend to be heavy. And manipulating them even with two hands is a little bit of a challenge. I, I tried it. <laughs> Not very good at it. He's chopping wood, holding the heavy axe with one hand. Therefore, the strength of that right arm is quite impressive. When many other people of noble rank wouldn't degrade themselves with physical labor, many diplomats wouldn't as well. This guy is quite well developed on his right arm. 
He's the kind of guy that was so paranoid when he shook hands that he'd like to have a little squeezing contest. See, I can now squeeze you. I'm a little better than you are. He looks at Germany. He looks at German history and says, going back, Germany's been treated very badly. Well, yes, people Germany wasn't treated very well because it is divided, various states. It does not represent a single power. And yet, when there are wars in Europe, going back a lengthy period of time, there is a tendency for powerful neighbors, including France, to come in and you fight battles in Germany. But now, now Germany is united. It's industrialized. It's powerful. And Wilhelm decides, by darn, we've got to make sure that Germany has its right place in the world, the right place in Europe, and everybody has to acknowledge that. I've already mentioned the colonies. <clears throat> I've already mentioned the naval arms race. See, these are good examples of how William says, you got to, you got to show us, you got to show us deference. He's crude in the way he does it. He's not a good diplomat by any means. Let's put it this way. He makes other nations nervous. This is a guy that is going, okay, people, you know, he, he, he says things he shouldn't say. He shoots his mouth off. He's not a good minister. In fact, he really doesn't even run his own country. We'll come back to that when we actually get to 1914, when this man who's essentially the head of his nation, in fact, does not head the nation. But he's reckless. And can we say that he, he makes decisions or allows other people within his government, including the military, which does come into the government, uh, to make reckless decisions? And perhaps push for war when maybe that wasn't completely necessary. We will discuss that in a little while. Background to war. Okay. We've talked about large numbers of men in the military. We've talked about the arms races, the quality and quantity of weapons. Well, let's get in, into the alliance system. You see, some odd things happened at the beginning of the First World War. We have an incident, which we will discuss later, dealing with an issue in the Balkans. The area of southeastern Europe, which can we say has got a lot of problems as far as political stability is concerned. They're fighting wars with each other and they're trying to essentially define boundaries and influence. But we have that going on down there. We can say that Austria, Hungary, for example, has some interest down there. So it's not terribly surprising they might become involved. Italy has some interest there as well. It's not terribly surprising they become involved. Russia, Pan-Slavism, Russia has some interest in the area. So I'm not terribly surprised they might become involved. But wait a minute. Let's go all the way over across the continent to Britain. They have no interest in there at all. They don't care what's going on down there. They don't have any political interest. They're, the trade the British do down there is quite minimal. So how do we explain an incident in the Balkans? actually involves places like Great Britain, have no interest in their, in them at all. We can make an argument that France is a little bit stretched as well as far as their interest in the Balkans. They have very little there, there as well. One of the ways we can explain this is by the alliance system. We have examples of wars in the 19th century. Uh, in 1864, Germany picks on Denmark, kicks Denmark out of northern Germany. In 1866, Germany fights Austria. It's a matter of a few months. Germany, Prussia, I should say, the major state in Germany, defeats Austria as well in a very brief period of time. Even the much more well-represented Franco-Prussian War, it literally only lasts a few months in 1870, had it not been for the siege of Paris, it would have been over faster than it was because Paris held out for a while. We usually say it went to like January 1871. The wars are quick. If you have a lengthy war, you got time to, shall we say, get your, your ducks in order, get your friends around. When you get your friends around and you have your alliances and will people come in and people not come in, those kind of things. But if wars are rapid, isn't it nice to have your friends around? You already have your friends lined up. So when you go to war, it's me and my buddies. 
alliance systems. Need to know who your friends, who's on your side quickly. Yeah. And as I already mentioned, allows a local war to engulf many nations rapidly. In a matter of days, Britain's involved. Uh, let's take a look at some of the alliances here. Lengthy alliances. Uh, there's, there's no such thing as an open-ended alliance where we're going to be friends forever. Uh, these are subject to renewal sometimes within the treaties themselves. We'll say this is an alliance for a certain length of, length of time we're to be renegotiated later. Or if it's simply open-ended, you'll want to renegotiate or re-examine the nature of the alliance as time goes by. But these are lengthy alliances. Some are natural alliances. Um, a good example would be an alliance between Germany and Austria. Germany, Germany speaks German. Austria, at least the Austrian part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the place that's closest to Germany, they speak German. And the royal family of Austria speaks German, share border. Yeah, they didn't get along in 1866, but after that, they patched it up. Can we say it's a natural alliance? Similarities in culture, similarities in language, similarities in history? Yeah. Now we got and something else. The Austro, you got Austria, Hungary, and Italy. You look at the triple alliance here. The Triple Alliance. Can take a look at this one. Is that a good map? It'll work, I think. Notice we have Italy here, which is part of an alliance, the Triple Alliance, which is Germany and Austria, Austria-Hungary. Italy. <clears throat> it's not a natural alliance. The Austrians, for example, and the Italians don't speak the same language. The Italians hate the Austrians. Oh, they hate the Austrians. You see, for much of the 19th century, Austria holds large sections of land in northern Italy, including the city of Venice, very important cultural icon, and it's an important trade center as well. When Italy finally achieves unification in the 1860s, they, they've been involved in this for decades of trying to get their nation together. I have every sympathy with people. You want your Yes, the people in your nation, your cultural heritage, you want them together. This is the same kind of thing we've seen in Germany about the same time. Get the same people, the same cultural heritage inside the same state. That makes sense to me. But if Aust if Italy hates the Austrians, because Italy was control Austria was controlling part of their country, and it was necessary to get the aid of France, an alliance to send their armies over here, to kick them out. I mean, you don't like these people. And Italy has designs on Austrian land down here. See, this is unnatural. This shouldn't be. On the other hand, why would this be? Why would you have this alliance? Let's take a look at the Mediterranean, maybe I'll give you a little bit better example of what I'm talking about. Okay, this is the Mediterranean. Notice Italy is right here. Italy and Sicily. Now, the powers in Europe are grabbing what they can of Africa. Virtually everybody who can grab something someplace does grab something someplace. Look at the map. Here's Italy. Here's Sicily. If you're grabbing a piece of Africa, it would not be logical for them to grab Tunisia. It's like the Italian boot kicking the Italian ball right there into the goal. There is where you should be. Everybody knows according to the Italians, everybody knows that, the, that Italy should take Tunisia, however the French do it. Now, Italy does get Libya, not much there. Well, actually, when the French grab Algeria and other places, well, there's not an awful lot, particularly in the interior. Nonetheless, Italy is furious. Look at France has, France has done to us. Of course, the French aren't going to back down once they've got it. Let me say this is a big mistake France made. 
You get nothing for this except enmity. So the Italians, to show the French, you are rotten people. We are going to join an alliance against with Austria and Germany, which is essentially an alliance the same to you. Why? We'll teach you a lesson. Well, one of the reasons why I'm going to call this an, a, a, a natural is that when war breaks out, Italy does not join Germany and Austria-Hungary. When war breaks out, initially, for the first year anyway, Italy declares itself neutral. When it does come into the war in 1915, it's with the Entente powers, in other words, Britain and France and Russia, to fight against Austria. Well, who sets up the uh, alliance system? Otto von Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor. An unscrupulous man in some respects, but he figured out a way of uniting Germany under the control of the Prussian state, which whose capital was in Berlin. Therefore, the capital of the United Germany would be in Berlin. Well, he doesn't want to get involved in colonies. He says it's a bad idea. It's a waste of money. He, he, he was right. But he wants an alliance. He wants to have strength. He wants, just wants to speak Germany out there. He wants to have somebody with him. I would say to cover his back. The way Bismarck put it was this. In a, an alliance, there is a horse and there's a rider. In other words, there's a more powerful state and a weaker state. He could have had an alliance with, with Russia. He, he did try, there's, there's an attempt, it lasted for a little while, to actually get an alliance between Russia, Germany, and Austria-Hungary. One of the reasons why that couldn't hold is that there are competing interests between Austria-Hungary and Russia, primarily in the Balkans. But Germany probably could have had an alliance with Russia. Why not ally yourself with a more powerful state and not ally yourself with a weaker state? Because Bismarck wants to be in control. If he allies Germany with Russia, then Russia is strong enough that it's going to be less sure that Germany is going to be making decisions. So Bismarck has alienated a very powerful state to actually get the support of a weaker state. Why would Austria go into this? By itself, Austria is too weak. Remember, when I was talking a little uh, last time about the power of Austria, Austria does not have a strong military. Um, it's not, it has various peoples in there, and sometimes the peoples don't even want to be part of Austria. If Austria is to maintain itself, it needs, it needs a big brother. It needs a pal that can take care of it, to help take care of them. So Austria, it's probably an Austria's advantage to go with Germany. Okay, these are the years of the alliance. Germany and Austria, Hungary, 1879. So this is in ex existence a long time before 1914. Italy, remember, Italy's angry at France. <clears throat> I told you why this issue about Tunisia. Italy, angry at France, joins in 1882. Now, if Austria, Hungary is weak, France, excuse me, Italy's even weaker. Remember, I said the trouble with Italy is that Italy does not have the economic ability to become a powerful, powerful nation. Well, then we have the Entente, which we call the Triple Entente because eventually we do have three nations involved. The Triple Entente is, or the, the initially the Entente, which is the understanding between Russia and France on both sides of Germany. Our map right here gives us a pretty good example. You see, France, of course, is afraid of Germany. France wants revenge for the war of the Franco-Prussian War. France wants to get a few areas back here of Alsace-Lorraine, which Germany took from them in 1871. France is an implacable enemy to, to Germany. Well, can you bring in a friend? Well, Russia. You see, Russia needs to be better organized, it needs to be better industrialized, but it is a very powerful nation. 
Now you can sandwich Germany between France and Russia. Boy, boy, wow. Hello. Um, that's, that's a very, very big coup for them. But let's take a look at Russia. Why would Russia go along with this? What's Russia's advantage? Now, France has a big advantage, and I've got, got a friend across the way who can actually help quite a bit. Well, you can look at this and say, well, why would Russia tie itself? If there's a war between France and Germany, should Russia not have the choice of going in or not? In reality, since they are an adversary of Russia, of Germany by this time frame, there's a pretty good chance they're going to come in on France's side anyway. Not a sure thing, however. So why would Russia take away its ability to act independently? Simply to perhaps aid France. See, France is in the ability to sweeten the pie. Remember, I just mentioned, while Russia is industrializing, and has an industrial base, it is so vast that they've got to have a communications network. In other words, they've got to have an important rail network to be able to strengthen their economy and their military. Once there is an alliance, this entente, this understanding between France and Russia in 1894, France will give, we call them loans. Uh, there's another word for loans, kind of gifts. <clears throat> we will give you, loan you money. Can we say sometimes the loans are at such a very low, low interest rate over such a very lengthy period of time that in fact it ends up being free money. Sometimes loans go between nations that are never, never paid. They never even attempt to pay. That's not uncommon. In fact, it's quite common. All right, these are loans, but can we say that a lot of people understand this is free money? So France is giving money to Russia to build up its infrastructure, particularly its rail network in the western part of Russia, over in this area. France wants the Russians to say, oh, by the way, we'll build up our rail network. Like, how about, how about a, a stronger rail connections between places like Warsaw, which is part of Russia, even though it's, the Poles live there. Um, why, would they, why would the French want this? Well, obviously the, the, the Russians want this, better trade, better commerce. But France says now Russia has an increased ability to deploy troops against the Germans. That's why Russia joins the Entente. It's good for their defense. It's good for their economy. Then we have the Britain. Why would Britain come in? Britain and France aren't friends. If you look at the history of Britain and France, oh my goodness. You can go back to the Hundred Years' War. It starts in 1337. Hundred Years' War is misnamed. It runs about 117 years. 1337 to, 13, to 1453. That's not the first time France and England back then are fighting each other. It goes way back to the Middle Ages. And they, they fought each other in the Napoleonic Wars very recently, shall we say less than 100 years ago. Um, there's animosities, even after the First World War. When France and Britain had fought as allies, the British still don't like the French, the French still don't like the British. So why on earth are you going to have this alliance? Britain realizes, as we're industrializing, Britain realizes as Germany's building this navy, that the power structure of Europe is going to shift. Do they really want to be left out of the matrix? Do they really want to be left out of the decision making if important issues, including war and peace, come to the fore? The special agreement is not as strong as the alliance between France and Russia. But the special agreement gives us a key as to why Britain comes in. Yes, they want to become involved. They don't want to be left out on the fringes. On the other hand, Britain has a small army, very big navy, small army, <clears throat> has a very, very large colonial base, imperialism in Africa and Asia. In Africa, the French are threatening them. In Asia, the French are threatening them as well, but also the Russians are threatening them as well. You see, even though Britain has a nice navy, it is going to be impossible 
for Britain to control its imperial empire, its colonial empire, without the support of France, without the support of Russia. Because if France and Russia decide they're going to make trouble for Britain, there's not an awful lot they can do about it. So part of the reasons why the British come in is to support the colonies. Do I have this here? Okay. Let's take a brief look at national interests. Why? What are your national interests? Don't we have to look and say, what, what, what are we concerned about? What is worth defending? What is what we don't have to worry about? Well, let's take a look. I'm not saying these are the only national interests, but I'm talking in broad terms. Britain wants peace and trade? Sure. They want the colonies, they want peace, they want trade. That's why they have the Navy to defend their coast, obviously, but obviously to promote commerce worldwide. However, Britain does fear a Europe dominated by one power. Can I come down here a little bit? I've already mentioned no interest in the Balkans at all. See, if you are Britain over here, and among your major trading partners on the continent include Belgium and the Netherlands, before 1914, they, they think the situation is just fine. Since Germany has acted more belligerent in the last few decades before 1914, Britain fears domination of a of particularly the Netherlands and Belgium by a foreign power. They do not want to have Germany control these areas. And they also don't want Germany to push France out because then you have one major power, not two, like France and Germany. You have one major power that, at least under Kaiser William II, does not mean them any any good. So we can say that Britain wants peace, but does not want a war that goes in the wrong direction. Francois Alsace-Lorraine, you've probably seen maps this many times. Oh, do we can find a map here. Yeah, in 1871, as I've already mentioned, Germany took Alsace-Lorraine from France. Now, from the standpoint of the Germans, Als Alsatians speak German. So why is a German-speaking people part of France? Shouldn't you take them back? Part of Lorraine speaks German as well. However, one of the reasons why they take Lorraine is that there are iron deposits there. Germany has a lot of coal but having iron ore available. So there's economic advantages. Now, the difficulty with this is, yeah, the people in Alsace, at least at the time, speak German. But they're used to French rule. They've been under French rule since, what, Louis XIV, Louis a long time. They're used to it. They like it. It's just fine with them. They're, they're functioning in a, in a good republic. Uh, they they think they've got better representation. Uh, they're treated pretty well. While Germany, at the same time in the 19th century, has a reputation of being more autocratic and more repressive. It would have been very interesting had a plebiscite been held where the Alsatians were actually asked, do you want to be part of France or you want to be part of Germany? They probably said, we're fine with France, we'll stay with them. Now, Bismarck knows that France is going to be upset if they take this. And he hums and haws for a little while. People are saying, look, Bismarck, as long as you hold Alsace-Lorraine, France will be your implacable enemy. And they're probably correct in this. Because France will always say, you ripped the heart out of their nation. And they must have their heart back. Take these provinces back. Of course, Bismarck realizes this. But then he decides, well, the real issue with France is not really Alsace-Lorraine. The, in, in, the real issue with France is that they lost a war. And by darn, they're going to get even. So they want revenge. And Alsace-Lorraine is just the window dressing. It's the excuse. I'm not quite sure he's right in this. On the other hand, 
he also wants revenge. He says, you look back in history, and he can count like 20, 21 times, that France and naked aggression invaded Germany. Well, he says, we never did that to them. Let's get even a little bit. Let's win a war, grab a province, and allow them to hate us anyway, because they're going to hate us. Well, all right. So France wants Alsace to run back. They want revenge for the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, very unfortunately, the French leaders and French people uh, want a war. They believe in war. Remember, this enormous buildup. Almost every man, man they can get in the military is there. Large percentage of their budget goes to the military. They've worked an alliance against Germany by aligning themselves with Russia. Many of them, many French, believe that war is inevitable. By the time you get to 1914, there's been issues that could have led to war earlier on. But this is a statement we see among a lot of Frenchmen. Better war than this per perpetual waiting. Look, let's get it done. And let's go on to something else afterwards. What does Germany want? We have to be careful when we discuss Germany. Actually, we have to be careful when we discuss the other nations as well. Because there are issues which we say were important to the nation before 1914. But after you get into the war, things do change. Going back to my discussion earlier, that when war gets started, it tends to have its own momentum, but to a certain extent also has its own mentality. One of the ways you justify the sacrifice of the war and sacrifice your man manpower is to win, to put more men in uniform. Another way you want to justify what you have done is by grabbing land. However, in 1914, Germany has its natural borders. All oh, well, the Swiss speak Ger Germanic dialects, very, very different than High German. The, the uh, Austrians speak German, but they're in their own state. Can we say that Germany has really everything it should have as far as their nationality and their language is concerned? Sure. Uh, so if you have what you want, why go to war? Well, to protect yourself, obviously. But what in Germany's best interest is probably peace and stability. However, sometimes you say you have you want war to maintain peace. If you can take care of a situation later on, you have peace. Now talk about borders. It is true after the war starts that war mentality kicks in. Germany is at least talking about more grabbing more territory. In 1918, with the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Germany forces Russia to cede huge amounts of land in what you and I would now call Poland, Belarus, even as far over to taking land in Ukraine. You see, this does not look like a nation that really wants peace and, its, and, its, and stability, and it already has its natural boundaries. That is extremely embarrassing to the Germans. And I, I can say extremely foolish, because in these kind of things, they make themselves look really, really bad. However, that's after the war, war gets going. 1914, just leave it the way it is. We're doing fine. Okay, <clears throat> Russia. Oof. Russia is big. It's industrializing. It's got a lot of problems with social unrest. They have an aristocracy that goes back centuries. Their landowners, the peasants own very little. They work very, very hard for to uh, pay a lot of money to the uh, to the landlords. It wasn't until 1861 that Russia even got around to freeing its serfs. See, serfs are peasants. They work the land. However, they have they're tied to the land. They're tied to the land because they can't leave, they can't enter another occupation. If they improve their agricultural productivity, the landlord just takes more. In freeing the serfs, you now have a free peasantry, but they still don't own the land. And they're still going to have to pay money to the landlord. And you have people. Remember, Russia is industrializing. 
going into the cities, St. Petersburg being an example, Moscow being another example, Kiev and others, you have people coming into the cities. And they're arrested because the working conditions are bad, the pay is poor, they're not benefiting from the wealth they're creating. Russia has a lot of social problems. In fact, when Russia was beaten in the Russo-Japanese War in 1904-1905, we have a major rebellion in Russia in 1905. It destabilizes the government. It, 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 you really have to call it the army to put it down. As a concession, the Tsar Nicholas II decides that he has to give a kind of representative government, we call it the Duma. He creates this as a showpiece. He really gives it no power. And the Duma ends up simply being a debating society, simply talk a lot. Now, when we talk about the Russian Revolution later on, the collapse of Russia, largely in 1917, the Duma does exist, and that will be a form of government that can kind of take over when the Tsar is forced to abdicate and nobody else will come up will come forward and take that position because it's very dangerous. Can we say in areas of social unrest, your nation needs peace. Why you have the rebellions, the revolts in 1905 is because of a war with Japan. You really need peace. To me, this is foolishness to think in terms of war. Of course, within a decade, if you go to war in 1914, you're going to have problems with social unrest. In fact, the same problems that exist in 1905 are going to come back in spades, particularly as the war goes poorly for the Russians. Do they really think they're going to beat Germany easily and fast? Well, a lot of people do think these kind of things on both sides of the line, that the war will be fast. Well, why would you go to war? Let's say you have a quick war, and you're victorious, so you don't have the time for all, all the problems of soldiers marching away, if you come back, and, and tr troubles with, with people forcing you to work harder hours, those kind of things. What if you have a quick war, a few weeks, few months, and you're victorious? Well, you march back, and the nation, nations come together during war, and the nations can celebrate victories. Go to a war as a distraction? Of all the nations that go to war, I honestly think that, that Russia, of course, we'll later have to put Austria on this pile as well. They made a big mistake. It ends up destroying both Austria and Russia during the war. Okay, we need to get closer to the war. Uh, a political assassination? leads to war. <clears throat> I've always enjoyed a quote by Yitzhak Rabin. Yitzhak Rabin was the Prime Minister of Israel. Many of you, I'm sure, know that. Of course, Israel has big problems after unification, actually before unification, when you literally have men and women throwing gas bombs at vehicles trying to defend your country from tanks. Once Israel is established, then you have other problems. You have wars in 1956, you have war in 1967, you have war in 1973, and there's a lot of problems with their neighbors that threaten them. A statement he made, which I've always enjoyed, the best war is the one avoided. I heard this first on German television. The best of Krieg is was man vermeiden kann. The best war is the one avoided. Let me ask this question. Let's not talk too much about Israel. Has Israel gone into war perhaps they could have avoided? However, could they avoid the wars they did go into? Let's ask a question. Let's use this as a point of departure and say, was the First World War a war that could have been avoided? I'm going to argue, and I don't want to oversimplify one of the most complicated issues in the history of, in all history actually, but I'm going to say I think this was a war that could have been avoided 
However, we have to take into account what people were thinking that time frame. Well, we have an issue here. First and second Moroccan crisis, 1905 and 1911. Now you have some German ships down in Morocco. They're there to try to support German interests. Of course, the French who own Morocco don't like it very much. They're down there. <clears throat> there is some threats and exchanges. In reality, without going into a lot of detail, there's enough provocation here that if Germany wanted to use this as an excuse to go to war, they could have done so. In neither case do they decide to opt for war. Let me talk about me. I'm the Cold War kid, remember? Oh, foolish young boy that I was. I wanted, I was looking at the Cold War and having and still reading about World War I, saying, uh oh, we're in trouble. You see, we have these crises. We have the Berlin Wall crisis in 1961. We have the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, when nuclear arsenals in the Soviet Union and the United States are facing each other. I believed that we have, in World War I, you have a series of crises. And a series of crises lead to more and more animosity. Rather than diffusing everything, they make matters worse. And eventually you end up in a crisis that leads to war. So, Berlin crisis, Cuban Missile crisis, bingo, we're counting up, we're all going to kill each other. I'm so glad I was wrong. But if you do not lead to war in the Cold War, does it necessarily mean that what we're having here is something that could not been, have been diffused? As bad as the Cuban Missile Crisis was in 1962, it was diffused because the countries involved did not want to nuke each other. Bismarck made a statement, though he died way before the war started. Bismarck made a, an interesting statement, looking at the political structure of Europe. Can we say that which is most destabilized is the Balkan area? No doubt about that at all. So he says the next war, there will, he believes there's going to be another war. It's going to be a big one. It's going to involve many European states. He said it would start over some damned foolish thing in the Balkans. Good guess, not terribly insightful because a lot of other people are thinking, yeah, there's political problems here as well. The Balkans are politically fragmented. Let's look at the Balkans, shall we say, right here. How about, well, actually I want it earlier than 1914. Let's try 1900 and see if I can get a, a, a good map on that one. Yeah, is that one a good one? Well. Uh, that's a busy map. It's almost too busy. In fact, I okay. Let's let's talk over time a little bit. Oh, it's one of these these time maps things. They're kind of fun, aren't they? Turkey had controlled the Balkans, the Ottoman Turks. They're Muslims. Had involved been involved in in controlling this section literally since the 1500s. Actually, the first invasion was in the 14th century, the 1300s. And we have various groups living in here. We have Greeks down here. We have Bulgars who are Slavic peoples. We have Serbians over here, also Slavic peoples. Romanians, Romanians speak a Romance language, distantly related to French and Spanish. And as we, they, see if I can get something a little bit easier. As it was about 1878 when a major uprising, these people finally kicked the Turks out of the Balkans. They still own this down in this area. But what we're seeing is that, remember, we have numerous nationalities. We also have numerous religions. We have Muslims. We have Catholics. We have Eastern Orthodox. 
various ethnic groups. And I'm just talking about some of the major ones. There's Ruthenians, and there's Croatians, and there's Bosnians. There's a whole, and Albanians, which I should, should have already mentioned, which is really quite destabilizing. What's even more important is when Turkey is kicked out, we call him the sick old man of Europe. Why is it sick? It's not industrialized, does not have the power base. When Turkey, the sick old man of Europe, right here, is pushed out, then we do have the Balkans, the various states of the Balkans, the various nationalities of the Balkans, deciding what are our natural boundaries, what do we want in our country. And some states, Serbia being among them, decide that they want the biggest nation as they possibly can have. Well, one of the problems is that maybe some of these people in the various valleys want to be another nation. You see, it's very hard to draw, draw very clean borders. On this side, there's people of this nationality. On this side, there's people of this nationality. In some cases, they're scattered all over. But the Serbians, who believe that they want a pan-Slavic state, in other words, we later are going to call it Yugoslavia. It's going to include Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia. He wants They want that in all in one state. As you know in following up recent history, that Yugoslavia is broken apart. And now we are down here with some of the component parts again, including Croatia and Serbia being separate nations. Serbia has another problem as far as they're concerned. They are landlocked. They have no access to the sea. If you're landlocked, you have a problem because you cannot directly trade with anybody except the people on your borders. You can't go out to the seas and trade internationally. So Serbia wants as many people as they can get. And Serbia also wants to get a seaport. They want to have control of the sea right here. I've already mentioned Italy has its eyes on this. It's already controlled by Austria-Hungary. So we can say these kind of interests are factors which destabilize, increasingly destabilize the area. I'm not wise enough to know exactly how you should draw boundaries over there. I think the ones we have now are probably a lot better than the ones that the Serbians are going to create at the end of the First World War. Well, let's take a look at what's happening here. Um, Bosnia-Herzegovina, can you see it right there? Yeah, the Turks have been pushed out. Uh, <clears throat> Austria-Hungary, which is up here, they've actually been administering this area for a lengthy period of time. By administrating, it means they're providing for defense. They are also trying to build up the infrastructure, better schools, better roads. They've already invested in Bosnia Herzegovina. One of the reasons why they've done that is that they want the Bosnians to think that, hey, being part of Austria is not a bad idea. Can we say that the actual annexation, however, where, they, where Austria Hungary actually comes in and decides now we are going to take Bosnia? and put it into our nation. I, I call that irresponsible. Why? Because this angers so many people. The Serbians want the Bosnians in their state. And now formally placing them in Austria seriously means that the aspirations of the Serbians have been thwarted. They're going to take this, shall we say, negatively. Uh, we call this the Bosnian crisis. The saber rattling, the Austrians say, Serbians don't back off. If you don't back off, we're going to go to war. And the Serbians say, well, you're doing the wrong thing. There is no war at that time frame. But can we say enhanced feelings against the Austrians? Then we have the Balkan Wars. Two major Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913. We call them the First and Second Balkan Wars. These are actually the, the people in the Balkans fighting over territory. They're still trying to get the biggest pieces as they can 
away from Turkey. Turkey's still over here a little bit. You see from the map the areas in dispute, the combat involved. Uh, <clears throat> what actually happens is this. Yes, areas are expanding. Yes, they grab more land. However, there's another issue here. Who's going to control what? In 1913, it's like everybody pick on Bulgaria. I know it's oversimplification, but Bulgaria loses this war. Bulgaria has a very, very interesting history. Remember, this is an area that is separated by language, by religion, by, by eth ethnicity and language. And Bulgaria, however, loses this, the Second Balkan War. It's on Germany's side in the First World War, and it loses that war. It's on Germany's side in the Second World War. It loses that war. So everybody wants a piece of Bulgaria, and these peace treaties have taken it. You say, well, poor Bulgaria getting picked on. On the other hand, Bulgaria is the only country in this area that even today does not have a significant minority problem. There are some gypsies that live there. They're not technically Bulgarians. But as far as minority problems, that's about it. Is there possible? This becomes a big issue. Is there a possibility that these local wars in the Balkans, 1912-1913, that these wars could spread if the major powers, Austria-Hungary, Russia, for example, got involved? So the wars, can we say, settle some issues, but there are other issues which are unsettled, and there are other issues that still end up being big problems. One which I should mention is, as the end of, end of the Second Balkan War, Serbia took Albania. Now, Albanians don't want to be part of Serbia. But remember, Serbia wants their land on the sea. Finally, the Austrians, they do more saber rattling rattle and say, look, you've got to get out of Albania. So just months before the war breaks out, something like, was it December 1914? the Austrians have forced the Serbians by threat to get out of Albania. But you see what's happening here, particularly between Austria and Serbia. Austria is fighting. It wants to grab land. Can we say they're irresponsible too? Serbia really wants to get Austria-Hungary out of this area because they believe that Austria-Hungary holds too many Slavic peoples, and Austria-Hungary is thwarting their ambitions to gain territory. We hear about the Black Hand. The Black Hand is a revolutionary group in Serbia, and their idea is to get the Slavs away Croatians, the Bosnians, away from Austria-Hungary to put them into their great state. Well, how are you going to get them out? Can you destabilize Austria-Hungary in doing so? This is a revolutionary group. They're a group of assassins. Now, they're bad people, but in a huge sense. Can you destabilize the monarchy by assassination? Can you just, can you, uh, go to a point where you can provoke a war. And maybe if Austria-Hungary loses the war, that you will have advantages from this. Can we say this group, therefore, is immoral? Assassination is immoral. And they're irresponsible. The man who actually leads the black hand, Dragutin Dmitrievich, that's too much of a mouthful for me. When I talk about him, I usually just call him Apis, which was his nickname. So he states, and he plans assassinations. When Serbia had finally gotten its independence from Turkey, and remember, these are people of their time frame, and they believe that, well, everybody's ruled by a monarchy, Russia, Austria, Germany. Uh, ruled by a monarchy, well, shouldn't we also have a monarchy? And the monarchy 
is come from other royal families. And according to the Black Hand, according to Apis, the king and queen of Serbia is playing ball too much with the Austrians. In other words, they're willing to have accommodations. And being friends with the Austrians doesn't hurt anything as far as political stability is concerned. And maybe you can get a little money to help build up your infrastructure. You see, there's good reasons to not provoke Austria. But can we say Apis gets his people to come into the palace and they murder the king and queen of Serbia? It is really an ugly affair. Uh, the royal family to know what happens, guns going off. Oh, they try to run and hide. As I re recall, they pull the king or queen out of the closet, trying to hide in there, trying to get away from them. They are brutally murdered. And they're, they're disemboweled. They put knives, they pull their guts out, and they take the corpses and throw them into the courtyard. Goodness! This is vicious, to say the least. Well, now what is the parliament? What are the leaders of... Serbia are going to say at that point. The Serbian parliament praises Apis for what they have done in murdering and butchering the royal family. The parliament. See, the government actually supports these assassinations, or seems to be. I don't have a good explanation. This seems to be so counter-moral. Why would you do this? I have wondered that if the Serbian parliament is really concerned that they might be knocked off next. We start having political assassinations. Well, maybe you're next. Maybe they'll get you going home. Maybe they'll get you out of the closet, blow your brains out and throw your body into the courtyard. Maybe they're being intimidated. But in praising them, they're actually saying, go right ahead. You're doing it with our approval. That's not the same thing as the parliament is doing them. But an allowing an assassination group to function and praising them clearly makes you duplicitous in anything they do. Is that correct? We can make that argument. So there's more assassination attempts. Uh, rather than having a mob of men come in to the royal palace and butcher the, the king and queen, uh, the Apis and the Black Hand are involved in more assassination attempts. A lot of them fail. They're going to knock off various political leaders. Sometimes you're going to knock off people in foreign countries. 1910, 1911. You see, you can send an assassin into, a, into an area or a country. And uh, there are times when assassins get cold feet. Well, I'm going to do this. But when it comes down to, to killing somebody, they back off. Sometimes the... Uh, opportunities don't present themselves. So assassination attempts doesn't always mean they're going to be successful. But they're still clearly operating with the tacit approval of the Serbian government. Now, am I out of time? Always oh, just getting good. Let me check on this and see how much time we've got left. We're running low on time. Let me just mention one thing. We do find Apis trying to get his men trained to kill. It's the Serbian officials, official government people, like a colonel in the army, who actually tries to train the assassins to use weapons, to use guns, and unfortunately, I can't follow that up. But if you have somebody who has a, an official in the Serbian government, and he's operating in a certain manner, that does not mean that the government is ordering him to do that. Let's come back and readdress this issue next time. In the meantime, hang in there. And this is Lecture 4, and we'll see you next time.